Well, everyone, we will dive into uh, to panel number four, which I think, in, in with all due respect to uh, the other panels that we will have through the course of the day, it's pretty hard to uh, to say that the medical panel, the medical supply chain, is not the most topical thing that we are dealing with in the uh, in the era of COVID. Uh, just logistically, uh, everyone is on a listen only mode, except for our uh, our six our six panelists. Oh, sorry, our five panelists, I should say. Um, and if, but if you do have a question that Samai will get through through the course of the attempt to get through through the course of the next 55 minutes, please put it into the, uh, the Q&A function. So uh, Samaya, I will pass it over to you. Great. Well, um, hello and, and welcome to everyone. Um, I hope you're enjoying this day as much as I am. Um, having been something of a kind of webinar event cynic, this is this has kind of thrown me out of that um, as I've been learning um, a lot a lot of really interesting things. Um, so I'm Samaya Keynes. Uh, I cover trade and globalization for The Economist. Um, I'm thinking of rebranding that to tariffs and deglobalization, but um, jury's out. Uh, so these are interesting times for global supply chains, and and I'm sure everyone is hoping that they were a little bit less interesting, um, but we are with where we are. Um, and obviously medical supply chains is one of the areas that has been getting um, most attention. Um, so in general, I'm also a kind of deglobalization skeptic, um, uh, much to the frustration of my editors. Um, but when it comes to the medical supply chain, I'm not so sure. There seems to be a lot of activity, a lot of action, um, and certainly a lot of, of talk um, about shifting supply chains, um, policymakers waking up to the fact that there are all these things that they can't control that they are getting blamed for um, when, when they go wrong. Um, Okay, I've moderated enough panels to know that you really don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from our wonderful panelists. Um, so let's go on to them. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves in a bit more detail um, as they start speaking. Um, but just to give you a rough idea of what's what's coming up. Uh, first of all, we have Michael Gagneau from the American Society of Health, Health System Pharmacists. Um, who's going to give us some historical and, and an empirical context for the current uh, concerns. Uh, then we have Monica He, who is going to talk about, um, sorry, Monica He's from the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Um, she's going to talk about you know, how, how companies are seeing this, what's going on there. Um, then we have uh, Ralph Ives from the Advanced Medical Technology Association. Um, he is going to talk about, you know, the responses to COVID, dive deeper, dive, dive into that, the, the, mo the most recent crisis. Um, and finally, Alexander Titus, um, who is from the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute. Um, and he is going to give us a bit more of a perspective on, on the right way to, to move forward and, and the conversations that need to, to happen. I've, I've just given a gross simplification of what they're going to talk about. Um, I'm sure they're going to, um, you know, all comment on each other and, and give us the, the great discussion that we are looking forward to. Um, and then after that, obviously, there will be audience questions. So please do send those in and I will attempt to um, relay them to the panel. Um, okay, so, and, and just remember, do introduce yourselves uh, uh, more fully. Um, first of all, can we go to Michael? Yes, good morning. My name is Michael Gagneau. I'm Director of Pharmacy Practice and Quality with the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. And one of my primary responsibilities centers around supply chain and drug shortages. Um, our organization represents about 55,000 pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and student pharmacists who act as um, care providers within hospital settings, ambulatory care settings. Um, and we have a long history, probably about 20 years of following drug shortages and advocating on, um, on policies related to our drug supply chain. Um, so as alluded to, I'll provide a little bit of background. Um, drug shortages are, are not new. As I mentioned, we've been managing them for on and off for about 20 years. And some major drug shortages have surfaced over the past several. So in 2017, Hurricane Maria hitting the island of Puerto Rico had a severe impact on some of our drugs, specifically small volume saline bags that we use for administration of antibiotics, of chemotherapy drugs, of electrolytes. Um, and that sort of highlighted our dependency on these consolidated sources of drugs. Uh, another example recently in McPherson, Kansas, there's a plant that produces injectable opioids, so things like morphine, hydromorphone. And, you know, the injectable forms of these drugs are not what we consider when we think about the uh, opioid crisis. So the, the manufacturer of these products wasn't necessarily uh, helped by reduction in quotas, uh, 
but the fact that this one facility produced about 70% of our supply of those drugs meant that when it was shut down, we had a shortage. Um, and then advanced to COVID-19, which was a little different. Typically, our shortages are based on a, on a, um, a supply issue. Quality affects manufacturing. Um, supply is reduced. With COVID, we had um, surges in demand, unprecedented surges in demand, in, especially in New York City, uh, early on in Detroit, Louisiana, um, other areas saw just much higher demand for drugs that are used to care for patients on ventilators. Um, more concerning, or in parallel, uh, on February 27th, the FDA released a statement that a drug shortage had been reported to them that was related to a site affected by the coronavirus. Um, they had also stated that 20 drugs were solely sourced, either the active pharmaceutical ingredient or the finished dosage were, um, was from China. So they were closely monitoring these drug supply because, you know, similar to the saline that was produced in Puerto Rico or these opioids that were uh, consolidated source in Kansas, uh, some of these drugs are solely sourced from China. So that consolidation is concerning. Um, we also had uh, India blocking export of some drugs. We had manufacturing facilities shut, shutting down around the world due to stay at home orders. Cargo capacity was reduced due to declining air passenger travel. Uh, there are parallel export bans in Europe. So this wasn't unique to China, but the, um, the challenge that we are faced with is we don't really know to what degree we depend on China. Um, Briefly, I'll talk about some of the quality threats and the location of manufacturing facilities. So in October, Dr. Janet Woodcock, then with the FDA, presented that 13% uh, of facilities that manufacture API or the active pharmaceutical ingredients are located in China. 13%. Doesn't seem like an alarming number, but I want to point out that that's where the facilities are located. That doesn't give us an indication of volume of how much of our drug supply re relies on those. Uh, similarly, the, the facilities that make the final dosage forms, 9% uh, are located in China. So again, doesn't sound alarming, but we don't know to what degree we depend on those, uh, those facilities. Um, so bottom line, the, the lack of transparency is really the largest barrier to understanding the threat to the US national security. Uh, we don't really have a clear information on where our drugs or API or even the key starting materials, the raw ingredients that are even needed for API um, are, where those are sourced. So for um, data that comes out of a, uh, IQVIA, for example, is typically related to market share in dollars. Well, that's not necessarily the cleanest way to look at it, drug volumes because the price of drugs can vary depending on um, whether they're uh, older generic drugs, oral, injectable. Um, there's some other initiatives to try to track down um, where our drugs are sourced. But fortunately, with the CARES Act that was signed into law in March, um, manufacturers are going to be required volumes for each of these drugs. And that'll give us a better picture of, um, you know, what, how, uh, what exactly is our vulnerability and how do we address it? Great. Um, and that was, that was wonderful. Um, so next, could we um, hear from Monica? Thank you, Samaya. Uh, my name is Monica, and it's an honor to be here. I'm with the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, BIO. It's a trade association representing companies that uses biotechnology to commercialize a product. So it's actually a, quite a broad base and includes biopharmaceutical companies as well as agricultural biotechnology companies. I think one of the unique uh, membership characteristic of BIO is that we represent a lot of the small and emerging biotech companies, the startups. Um, they may be small, but they do account for the majority of the innovation R&D pipeline in the globe. So I think it's important to highlight the, um, that the United States continues to lead the world in innovation and biopharmaceuticals. And you know, in response to COVID, we have seen unprecedented response um, with right now more than, uh, more than 720 unique active compounds in development. And the majority of that, nearly 400, are developing on, by United States companies. Um, so I think it's really important that as we look at supply chain and how do we build resilience and supply chain integrity, that we continue to ensure that these innovative companies are supported and that they are closely consulted as the government or policymakers look at you know, strategies or policies to um, build up or strengthen the supply chain. 
Bio is very supportive of increased U.S.-based manufacturing, and our companies are, you know, every co- as every other company right now, examining um, their supply chain and examining it from a risk mitigation or, um, you know, resilience and duplicity approach. But I do think it's important to know that the U.S., maybe contrary to some data, and I think Michael pointed out, the U.S. is actually quite competitive. Um, more than half of finished products, finished drugs, are um, manufactured in the United States. 20% of APIs are manufactured in the United States. And we actually lead the world in the number of manufacturing facilities, uh, with 592, China being a close second. Now, be that as it may, I think it's important to note that some of the policies that you know, have been circulating could potentially have an adverse impact on some of these competitiveness in the industry. So for example, um, you know, we would definitely caution against broad mandates to require onshoring or localization policies. And the reason is because, as Michael earlier pointed out, the supply chain and the manufacturing process is extremely complicated. For bio pharmaceutical companies, it could take anywhere between five to 10 years to reallocate or restructure a supply chain, and it could cost up to $2 billion. So the cost um, impact is quite significant in that any kind of rash or, or you know, broad mandates could potentially really create a cost burden on our companies and, and in, a, in a way, you know, provide a burden on their innovative competitiveness. We also want to make sure that as we retool and rethink our supply chains, that we ensure that we don't cause any unnecessary shortages or distribution problems. Finally, I think any approach to supply chain security or integrity would require a multilateral approach, right? We can't think of this as a China, US, US, China problem. Um, this is all, I think our, our other panelists will allude to this as well. It's quite a complex network where products are, or raw materials are um, developed and where the finished products are done. And so I think it's really important to approach this you know, instead of a bilateral from a multilateral perspective, and in our ability to discuss these with other markets or in our, in our way of developing policies to make sure that we don't, um, I think it's really important to caution policymakers to move away from any kind of localization policies that may be mandated. For many, for a long time, the US government actually has, been, has taken a very strong position against um, onshoring or localization policies in other markets. And it's very simple, right? That actually hurts U.S. exports. And that creates a lot of trade irritants and um, barriers for U.S. innovative products. And so, you know, if U.S. moves forward with certain policies that may move toward that direction, we could potentially see reciprocity from other markets. You know, so I'm not even talking about retaliation, but just a simple fact that could other markets take up similar, similar policies. And what impact could that have on the global supply chain as well as drug access in the United States. So I think those are really important questions and um, hopefully we'll have a more robust discussion later. But thank you very much for the opportunity. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so next up we have Raw Fives. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Really appreciate uh, participating in this US China Business Council Forum. Um, as others, uh, um, well, first, um, I am Ralph Ives. I'm executive vice president for a global department here at Avamed, and we represent about 400 manufacturers of the full range of medical technology products, uh, cardiovascular orthopedic implants, um, uh, in, vi- in vitro diagnostics, uh, big uh, imaging equipment, and personal protective equipment, which is, of course, uh, one of the items that uh, many people are talking about these days. And while we're a global association, uh, we represent most of the well-known large uh, multinational companies. uh, Our membership is composed of about 75% of small and medium-sized enterprises right here in the United States. And this brings me to my first point. And that is, as Monica um, indicated, our industry is also very diverse and complex. Um, The World Health Organization counts nearly 2 million types of medical devices, over 22,000 different categories. Um, The innovation is rapid. We uh, are companies replace existing technologies about every uh, 18 to 24 months. Industry is global. 
American companies provide uh, excellent quality medical devices to virtually every one of the 195 countries in the United Nations. Um, in terms of where we, the United States, gets our technology, about two thirds is manufactured in the United States. 3.5% comes from China. Again, 3.5% of our medical devices comes from China. My second point is the industry responded very rapidly to the unprecedented surge in demand caused by COVID. Um, just give some examples that have been in the news, ventilators. The seven leading US manufacturers were producing on average about 700 uh, units a week prior to COVID. That wrapped up to two to 3,000 um, during the first quarter. And the summer, it's around 10,000 units uh, uh, per week. Personal protective equipment, which um, I think people are well, uh, well know, it's surgical masks, the N95 respirators, the gloves, gowns, face shields. Um, manufacturers have been adding new shifts, been repurposing existing product lines, massively ramping up production. Uh, just to give one example, uh, 3M had been producing close to 100 million masks per month in the U.S. market. That's up from 35 million um, uh, uh, in January. And finally, diagnostic testing, also very much in the news. The industry mobilized on a massive scale uh, to uh, a demand that really shows a uh, little sign of slowing. And our, our data, which began, we began collecting relatively uh, late um, in a form of a registry, um, about 145 million uh, tests uh, for COVID were shipped in March. Uh, and uh, August, by August 22nd, that is up to 1.3 million. So ramping up there. My final set of points, and I was asked to provide three points, so this is my third point. Um, it, it goes in the line that Monica was mentioning. And uh, we were faced up on the Hill in particular with um, a number of bills that basically said, buy America, reshore, et cetera. And while it was fairly easy for us to point out some uh, problems with those bills, they were asked, what are you for? So we came up with what we call um, principles for preparedness and we call it our blue ribbon paper for reasons I have no idea what we'll call our, our public relations people that came up with that. But there are four, four basic principles. First, store sufficient supplies in the strategic national stockpile and in states to meet the initial surge in demand of any public health emergency. Second, keep supply chains resilient so that medical technology companies can efficiently access components uh, and, and their raw materials um, during, uh, uh, um, as they ramp up production. And again, this goes back to the points that uh, Monica was making. Supply chain is very complex. Manufacturers get their, uh, 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 their inputs from many sources. For example, a ventilator we're talking about has some 1,500 parts come from all over the world. Um, the uh, third principle is um, support robust allocation system um, in advance. Know where and how you're going to get cr uh, critical uh, medical devices uh, to and where the hotspots are uh, within the United States. And fourth, invest in America. We're fine with that. Um, invest in people, research and development, the facilities uh, su to support a strong domestic uh, technology industry so we can continue to meet patients' needs right here in the United States. But again, as uh, pre two previous panelists mentioned, you have to be smart about the way you do it. Um, we agree 100% with all the comments Meta uh, Monica made about uh, forced localization and so I won't repeat them. I'll just say, Monica, I agree with you and happy to take any questions and uh, participate in this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and next we have Alexander Titus. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I'm excited to get to have this awesome and important conversation. Um, I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer at the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, or ARMI, uh, ARMI for short. And what ARMI is, is a public-private partnership between the Department of Defense and the nonprofit ARMI to, to run the BioFab USA program, which is a program to advance the state of U.S. biomanufacturing for uh, tissue engineering and cell and cell therapy types of products. But this is, this is related to and important to the national security conversation uh, that we're having. My previous job, 
um, just before this was the first ever head of biotechnology strategy for the Department of Defense. So thinking of how the enterprise of the entire DOD uh, approaches biotech uh, and everything that it can apply for. Uh, that it can apply to from novel materials coming out of synthetic biology to new ways to do medical um, across the board. And this, I, I really want to emphasize one of the points that Ralph just made is the, the key word in the na- this new national security imperative is resilience. So similar to what Monica said, you can't just say, bring it all to the U S because uh, you can have fragile point of failure suppliers within the U S as well. It's one, you know, we have more control over domestic supply chains than we do international supply chains, but resiliency in our supply chains um, is far more imperative than having it, than what soil it's built upon. Uh, A good example of this, so Army is based, is headquartered in New Hampshire, and in New Hampshire, um, Dean Kamen is the the executive director, um, is the you know, a long time inventor, and he has connections through all of his R and D and his manufacturing for a, a, from a, you know, a lifetime of engineering with many suppliers in China that can provide PPE. When all of a sudden there was a PPE shortage, the federal government could not get enough PPE, but a small, you know, nimble, innovative company with good relationships was able to supply and bring in PPE that then the state of New Hampshire, the Department of Veterans Affairs came to, to DECA and said, we really need your help to, to bring in PPE and be able to, to meet this initial surge. So that you know, goes to one of Ralph's points of having enough for an initial surge, but it's hard to stock the types of vaccines and supplies that you'd really need. Um, but the, the, the equipment to be able to respond, collect ourselves and think will add to a lot of that resiliency. My second big point is that the way that we build in resilient supply chains is starting to use, you know, as new technologies emerge, building those into how we uh, approach supply chains. So, you know, the advances of how we do data-driven predictions, AI, machine learning, all these kind of things to be able to predict and work for, um, to understand where these surges are going to be. But then new technologies like synthetic biology and other types of engineered biology, where we can start to produce alternative sources to a lot of these uh, APIs, which then gives us an additional leg to to work upon, which then builds on the resiliency. And then the third point I'd make, since we're all making three points, um, is that public-private partnerships, because supply chain resiliency in the United States is one, a business issue, but is also a you know, a public good issue. And so these public private partnerships are a a phenomenal way to go about this. And so, as I said, I represent um, one of these manufacturing innovation institutes. Um, There's currently 15, three of which are focused on biomanufacturing related, all of which have uh, pivoted to help with the COVID response. But one of them, Nimble, the National Institute for Innovation and Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals, Um, is advancing our ability to manufacture uh, new biopharmaceuticals faster at lower cost uh, in different types of manufacturing and supply situations. Army represents one focused on similar applications to tissue engineering and cell-based therapies. And then there's a forthcoming one that's still under competition that is a bioindustrial manufacturing institute focused on finding alternative ways to produce critical materials and supplies that we need um, even outside of the, the medicines themselves, but the things that are crucial to our medical supply chain, such as rare earth metals, other kinds of chemistries, and what have you. And so overall, it's a very deliberate choice that we need to make. Um, we're being very, right now we're stuck in our, on our heels and reacting, but our ability to be deliberate and provide that resiliency, you know, build those partnerships, not just with a sole source in the U.S. or a sole source from China, but a resilient set of partners for all of the applications we need uh, is really how we're going to start building in this going forward. And so if you think from a national security perspective, so we think about this from a public health perspective, but if you think if there is a, you know, a military conflict and the vast majority of pharmaceuticals used by the U.S. Department of Defense are generic brands that come from sources, say, from China, then that provides a large vulnerabilities where 
if they choose to shut off those supplies. It's not just a public health issue, but it's also a military readiness issue. And so resilience in those supply chains really is a national security imperative. Great. Okay. So, um, so first of all, um, would Monica, Michael, um, you spoke earlier, would you like to respond to anything you've just heard or shall I, um, go ahead and start asking questions? So Mara, maybe I'll make one quick point. Um, Michael had mentioned the CARES Act, which I do think is a really important point because there is a mandate in there, um, to do an assessment, a report on the health security and national security risks relating to the foreign production of critical medical supplies. And, you know, I think there's a lot, you know, I do think there's a lot of um, need for better information. And so hopefully after the study, um, you know, we'd be work happy to work with Congress to develop strategy and strategic plan to then incentivize some of the constructions and operations, you know, to help support, you know, uh, medical supply development in the United States. But I do think that's a really important um, policy directive that's uh, moving forward. And I would like to um, to reinforce something that both Ralph and Alexander actually said. So Ralph mentioned having adequate supply in the stockpile. Um, you know, one of the challenges with that is that product's going to expire, so you have to have the ability to turn over, replace what's in there, um, and having the manufacturing capacity. Actually, I think Monica mentioned it too. Look, it's expensive. It's, it's time consuming to build up this capacity. Nobody wants to sit on excess manufacturing capacity when it may not be needed. Um, storing product is expensive. It can expire, it takes up um, space. So I think some of the, the solutions to these problems revolve around being able to ramp up capacity quickly. Um, and there's a lot of advanced manufacturing techniques that can be used that can make the supply chain more agile where we may identify a handful of critical drugs that we need to be able to, sure, maybe we source them from overseas, maybe we have 40, 50% of our supply coming from already domestically, but can we within a month, two months, three months, flip a switch that gets us 100% of what we need made here without having to be concerned with um, some, some sort of disruption, whether it's a natural, natural disaster, whether it's a trade war, whether it's a pandemic like this, um, so I think those points are really important and and, um, and I think the new technologies will help us address some of those issues. I also want to follow up on what Michael just said is natural disasters are a huge threat to our supply chain resiliency. So if we reshore and then centralize it all somewhere that's hit by a hurricane or a forest fire or an earthquake, we're in just as much of a tough spot as if it was all coming from uh, from an overseas partner that decided to stop sending it to us. So it's, you have to, we have to be very deliberate about our domestic resiliency uh, as well as our international focus. And, and this is Ralph. The only, only thing I would add, and I, I agree with both, uh, both the previous speakers, um, is the, the additional cost in terms of medical devices of uh, moving even components is the regulatory because we have to comply with FDA uh, regulations. And when we make changes to the product, uh, that has to be taken into account. So you, as some previous speaker said, you just can't throw a switch. Um, there's time and, and a lot of money involved. The other point I make to, to kind of pile on Monica's point about uh, the, the, the study is you, you may be aware of this, a Section 332 study that um, the Congress asked the International Trade Commission to do on this issue. And I think that's a very important study that's going to come out because often the uh, Congress is informed by this um, uh, bipartisan, independent uh, body that comes up with uh, with analysis. So we we tend to uh, definitely tend to participate in the 332 study, and uh, um, very hopeful that they will recognize in their study the complexity of the supply chain, and that would help inform uh, the administration, whichever administration it is, and the Congress. Thank you. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna um, uh, slightly play devil's advocate um, here. Um, so if I were to be really sort of mean and try and characterize some of the responses of the industry to all of these concerns, it would be um, sure, you know, you may think that there's a problem, but let us deal with our supply chains and give us money, 
Um, so, you know, please do pay for our, you know, give us help for R&D. We'd love some tax incentives, um, you know, but, but, but hands off the kind of decisions about where we actually locate um, production. Um, there's a kind of related, I guess, question about all these plans, right, which is, well, supposing we, we do these reports, we draw up these plans and we find, oh dear, we're you know, very, very reliant on China. Well, what happens next, right? So should we you know, just rely on um, uh, the private sector to, to reorganize? Do you actually need something else? Do you need some kind of coordination or incentives or sticks or carrots to, to actually affect the change once you've identified that there's, there's an issue? Um, so yeah so first of all i would invite you to kind of um the the the, the question encapsulated in that first point was you know is this just um business as usual is there any kind of benefit to something um that goes further than than a sort of transparency mandate um for for shifting supply chains or has is this really something that the private sector has kind of totally woken up to and is doing all on its own um and doesn't need any any intervention there I would say that there absolutely needs to be, so I'm an advocate of both the public sector and the private sector interplaying, whether it's formally or informally, but we have to remember that we're in the position we are with our supply chains now because the incentives were to drive those costs down and locate manufacturing and production capacity overseas. So there are plenty of ways, and I don't, I'm not suggesting any specific incentives, but there are plenty of ways to create those market dynamics and those incentives to relocate where the private sector wants to do that kind of stuff um, rather than the, you know, the incentives that are provided, say, in China, where China puts being a global leader in biotechnology and healthcare in their five-year plan and subsidizes everything to the point where it's hard to be globally competitive. There is for other organizations and countries to be competitive. So there are ways to, to frame incentives where it's not a mandate, it's not a law, it is a willingness to improve the market opportunities for organizations um, at the same time building in those resilience. I agree and I think there's there is some movement private sector I think not only within the industry but within buying groups who are looking at you know their commitment to their customers to meet contractual obligations on purchases they're starting to examine okay well we're going to sign a contract for so many units over so many years for our, for our hospitals that we represent. They have to evaluate how likely it is that, that those quantities will be met. Um, and so we are seeing a little bit of a private sector sort of starting to investigate into um, the resiliency of, of these drugs. And I do want to point out that primarily what we were talking about, what we were faced with uh, were not these, um, you know, the bio drugs, they're, they're not drugs that are typically considered, um, you know, novel or, or, you know, these are older drugs. These are drugs that have been around for decades, um, sedatives, pain medications, things that we use to keep patients relaxed and comfortable while they're on a the ventilator. Um, the margins on these drugs are actually quite slim. Um, and so there's economy of scale. If, if a manufacturer doesn't get one of these contracts, they may opt not to make that product anymore because they can't make enough units to for the margin to make sense. And so we've driven down the cost of these drugs so low that they've been, um, you know, economically, it makes more sense to make overseas. It's cheaper. Um, so there probably do need to be some sort of incentives, whether it's tax incentives or um, some sort of support for, for developing robust quality systems in these manufacturing um, facilities to make them more reliable, to, to reduce those quality issues. Um, potentially to onshore them using some of these new manufacturing technologies. So I, I think the answer to that is both um, private sector and, and uh, through regulation or incentives. Uh, so if I may add, I actually think there are, um, you know, there has been and continue to be ongoing dialogue between industry and government decision makers on to, you know, to not both understand and improve understanding and education on how the supply chain, the complexity, and what are the incentives and challenges. Um, so I don't think it's a, I think there has been a lot of conversation and I think there is conversation and discussions on how do we collaborate better and how do we work together? You know, even ahead of the, the studies that uh, Ralph mentioned as well as the CARES Act. Um, and 
you know, kind of reflecting on what Alex said, I do think that now in, in addition to incentives, I think there are ways to think about how do we increase predictability? How do we include, in, increase transparency? And how can technology <clears throat> and data help us better do that? Right. So in May, um, President Trump released an executive order on strengthening the national stockpile. You know, how do we make sure that, um, you know, the, the products that are, you know, uh, that would be included in the process, the stockpiling, the how do we make sure that those are efficient? How do we make sure that those are distributed? And, um, and how do we work together with companies to make sure that there is resilience and supply? I think there are ongoing conversations, but there are definitely ways to incentivize and improve the infrastructure. And I think there are certainly a lot of rooms to grow in that area. And I think technology and innovation could really be supportive of that. And, and I'll just, uh, I think we're all in raging agreement on so many things uh, here. And I agree with everything Monica indicated. Let me uh, uh, turn it a little bit to your question, the Defense Production Act. Um, we hear politicians wave the Defense Production Act that this magically is going to make um, uh, 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 drugs and devices appear. Um, behind the scenes, we have worked, our industry has worked with the, the, the federal government um, under the aegis, if you will, of the DPA. So um, some of the, the, the ventilator allocation was helped by, um, by the federal government. Um, we're working very closely on um, 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 uh, uh, testing with the federal government. So we definitely believe in uh, um, uh, public-private partnerships. One area that um, uh, I think Alexander touched on was supply chains. How do we restore trust in the supply chains globally? And um, I, I did a lot of trade negotiations. So I am not enamored with the structure of the WTO, despite the fact that a lot of countries violated the WTO during this pandemic, um, uh, their, their commitments. So I, I, I'd be interested, um, we have some ideas in our, our blue ribbon paper in terms of uh, restructuring um, commitments under the, uh, either under the WTO or separately. But I was wondering if there are other ideas in terms of how do we get, uh, it was referred to by some people as trusted traders. How do we get countries to restore the trust that if we are dealing and about 20% of our, our med tech comes from Europe, that we can trust the Europeans to ship. And likewise, the United States uh, stopped uh, exports of PPE. How can other countries trust us? So how can we restore that trust? Um, I'd be curious, and I know I'm not the moderator, but <laughs> I just thought I'd ask this uh, other panelists if there's some ideas in restoring that trust, because I think that's very important to uh, getting that resilience of, of supply chains back. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, I have I have a couple of others. So, but but I but it's a very good question. Did Alexandra, Michael, or Monica, do you want to? Do you have any big thoughts? I don't have a great idea. Um, I think that would require some very good uh, deep thinking. But I would say that one of the challenges is that politicians are incentivized by their voters to do those, to cut off and focus on domestic us, whether you're in Europe or any elected leader is gonna be criticized by the opposition party for having sent resources to another country when their country was in need. And so I don't have a good solution to that, but that is an issue that, especially we're in a particularly politically polarized time, and that's gonna be, a, I think, an issue going forward for quite some time. Yeah. Um... Rob, I think that is an excellent question. I mean, I think it's understandable that, you know, right at the emergence of the COVID pandemic, that a lot of countries and markets, um, you know, immediately shut down as a way of, you know, have, have a rapid response to the rapidly spreading um, virus. But I do think we are seeing some leadership, um, I think, trying to go about it the right way. So, for example, <clears throat> earlier this year, um, Singapore and New Zealand, um, initiated a pledge in trade and essential goods, like right? pledging to eliminate some of these market barriers to make sure that there is an international flow of critical supplies. Um, so instead of everybody closing down their borders, they were trying to take a step forward and say, let's recognize how complex and international multilateral these supply chains are. And that for us all to you know, address and respond to the pandemic, we have to have open borders, at least to some of these products. 
Um, and I think other countries eventually also join as well. And I think these kind of leadership are going to be critical moving forward and not just, you know, addressing the current pandemic, but in, tr in, in terms of thinking about public health, in terms of um, pandemic response, you know, in preparation for the next one, right? So I think, um, I think there's definitely a lot of lessons learned, but we are also hopefully can, um, you know, highlight and spotlight some of these good leadership and good ideas. And hopefully that will help us respond to the next pandemic or the next disaster. I would also say that we can't take a one size fits all uh, response to every disaster that threatens our, our uh, supply chains because a pandemic and a, a major tsunami have very different global impacts. So when there's, a, when there's a hurricane or a tsunami or a massive earthquake, despite having serious regional disturbances, it's not necessarily gonna impact countries on the other side of the world other than supply chain perhaps but a, something like a pandemic doesn't respect borders. That's not a localized issue. So in that case, there, a perspective could be taken that sending you know, seriously needed PPE and supplies to another country to try to localize the impact rather than let it be a global mm -hmm. spread is in the best interests of the country sending those. And so that's a messaging that is hard to get out there right now, but very much the way that pandemics spread, uh, it is in everyone's best interest. If the entire world sent their entire supply of resources to wherever it starts to stop it from spreading. You know, Ralph, I, I'll take a shot at the question. I'm not in the industry. Um, my immediate response was operating in good faith that came to mind as soon as you were asking the question. And I think the both examples that Monica and Alexander just provided highlight that, you know, despite not being an in industry that that's probably the right approach is, you, you know, you prove that you're, you're there for the benefit of everyone. Um, you know, the other thing, I think the market over time will react. If you realize that the source you were using for something is, is not going to be reliable, you start to find another source. Um, and sure, that's time consuming and, and may not help you in the current pandemic. But I, I think, um, you know, all of a sudden a new manufacturer or competitor of whatever that supply is, is going to emerge. Um, so uh, again, not within the industry, that, that's my external perspective. Great. Um, okay, so we've got some questions rolling in. Um, so um, it's possible that not all four of you need to answer all of them just so that we can get to all of them. Um, and, and the first one is um, your take on whether tariffs and related simple government trade policies really significantly change manufacturing trends or, uh, you know, the, is the business case really reliant on, on other things? And um, so we have tariffs, which are obviously, um, you know, are the reality um, for lots of products now. Um, I'd also want to add to that um, government procurement. Um, policies, which obviously the, the Biden administration has been um, uh, touting. Anyone? <laughs> um, well, uh, I want, uh, maybe not all four of you, but more than zero of you. I'll, I'll unmute if that's... Uh, um, when um, USTR first decided to impose the Section 301 tariffs, we, Avamed, of course, strongly objected. And we objected um, not just because we felt our companies should not be affected by the tariffs, because we realized what would happen is the United States imposes tariffs and China imposes tariffs. So right now we have tariffs on um, uh, products going both ways. But also the very principle of why are you imposing tariffs on healthcare related products? Over the course of US um, uh, trade uh, retaliation, healthcare related products have been exempted for obvious reasons to health and safety of the American people. So we think just in principle, there should not be tariffs on healthcare products. And we continue to, to argue that, um, particularly during COVID. In terms of government procurement, uh, I'm sorry, and go a little bit further. Yes, when the trade war started, um, our manufacturers began looking at uh, supply chains. I'm not sure how much tariffs themselves caused the change and COVID is obviously um, having looking at the supply chains, but just the, the tariffs on, on, uh, on medical supplies just seem to be the, the wrong policy. In terms of government procurement, I'm sure people out there were well aware that the administration and Congress has been considering Buy America. 
And one of the things that we, Avamed, argued, or no others argued, it just seemed rather strange to put Buy America provisions, requirements during a pandemic. I mean, you're, uh, a few months ago, we were kind of begging China, can you please send us your, your products? And then we go, oh, no, no, Buy America, you have to get it off in the United States. So at least the most recent Buy America provision excluded pandemic related goods, that is the executive order. Um, I'm not sure some of the bills up in the Hill have done that, but just um, as, as, as the pickup of what Monica indicated previously, we think, think by America, that type of requirement is not the right policy for the United States, uh, for other countries, localization requirements, and particularly to impose by America when you want the products wherever they come from, doesn't make uh, much sense. So, uh, Radio Free Ralph. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. yeah, but so just to, um, I guess, follow up um, and, and maybe um, Monica or Alexandra or Michael, um, I guess the question is, you know, if, if, uh, if they were to be put in place, would they have any effect, right? Are they big enough to move the needle? Um, because you could say, well, you know, in the heat of this pandemic, it's not what you want to do. But if you're trying to reshape supply chains so that when the next pandemic comes or when the next disaster comes, you don't find yourself begging China for supplies, right? Is it, you know, do they, do they work in any way or is it just overwhelmed by other factors? Monica, do you want to? Oh, sure. I mean, I actually, I'm, I was just going to echo a lot of what Ralph was saying. I think trade um, tariffs certainly have an impact on export as well as import of products. And I would say probably at the end of the day, have a higher um, adverse impact on U.S. producers, especially those that, um, you know, have to import certain, you know, very important supplies or ingredients. And at the end, also, um, these, this goes back to an earlier point we make about the cost of doing business. And that, you know, while we're trying to uh, allocate a lot of our funding and resources and capital toward innovation and driving, um, you know, R&D, it is very difficult when you're also having to face some of these um, uh, trade concerns where they could you know, not only increase the uncertainty of how you do business, as, but also the cost and expense of doing product, of developing products. But I want to uh, maybe just quickly note that on the government procurement agreement, so it's interesting that uh, President Trump's executive order on um, you know, ensuring essential medicines does um, require USTR to start ne renegotiating some of our trade agreements, including the government procurement agreement, as a way of, uh, I think it's kind of in line with the Buy America directive. Right, so that it's um, so it's it's basically saying um, eliminate foreign competition in the U.S. market. But I do think there are um, there could be rippling effects that could become actually more adverse to U.S. productivity and product and co competition overseas, in the sense that you know these these agreements are if not multilateral, certainly bilateral. And this goes back to the the caution against localization, and as that is. You know, if you require, if you're removing U.S. requirement on government procurement and, and, you know, excluding certain other products, what happens if those other markets take on a similar policy and U.S. innovative products are then similarly excluded from their purchasing um, policies or requirements or markets? And I think that could have a serious ripple effect as well as kind of a downward spiral for how competitive and, and you know, innovative industry in the United States. So I think, you know, whenever we think about these policies, given how complex and, you know, um, the, the supply chain and the industry is, it's really important to think about what are the, the repercussions and the consequences of these U.S. policies. Can I ask how um, easy, another question, I'm going to combine two, two questions. Um, I guess it's kind of how easy things would be to move. So we've got one question um, about China as the major supply of APIs. You know, how easy would it be to shift um, production to domestic to US manufacturers um, or even just other countries that are not facing such great scrutiny from um, the security establishment? Um, and there's a kind of related question about, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a price tag attached to all of this. Um, and, you know, is, is there any appetite recognition from, from Congress to just sort of, you know, s lay out what it, what it wants and, and, and I guess um, the, the cost of that? 
for, for me, a lot of this conversation is around what works more effectively, the carrot or the stick. The government is very good at wielding the sticks. The private sector very much require, responds to the carrot of increased revenue. Um, and so a lot of these, in a lot of the discussion is around, you know, around tariffs or what have you is, you know, can you slow down progress or steer it in a way? So, and, and that goes to both of these issues. It would be, I mean, with the right incentives, the private sector would run to, to U.S. manufacturing uh, and leave China if, if the incentives were there or the carrots were there. So I think it's extremely difficult if you're purely putting kind of repercussionary policies into place without providing, you know, it, think of it as, you know, a very simple analogy is when you try to put your kids to bed, right? You can incentivize them and they're much more willing to behave on their own versus, you know, punishment is oftentimes difficult. And so we've seen that, you know, anytime any administration around the world says, no, you have to do what I say because I said, then the private sector responds and gets all prickly and says, well, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so I think that's a big, a big challenge. And I think that there are plenty of ways to produce, to provide carrots that Congress could be uh, focused on. But if you think about I mean, take billions of dollars. The, the U.S. spends trillions of dollars on healthcare every year. And so it's, it's when you think of the total scope of how much we spend on these things, um, it is not a, a, a significant increase in costs potentially. But I'm not an economist, economist, so don't quote me on the actual dollar numbers. No, I want a, I want a specific number. <laughs> the nearest billion. Um, Ralph, did you want to jump in? Um, I see I'm unmuted, so I guess I, guess I will. Um, it depends on the product. I mentioned that we, uh, WHO has, says we have too many different types of products, and there are various risk categories. So if you're talking about something relatively simple like a gown, um, surgical gown, it's probably relatively easy. And I, I like Alexandra's point about um, positive incentives. If it's much more complicated, like a ventilator, then you're looking at all the component parts of that ventilator, that where are they coming from? And um, that's very difficult. And also the regulatory component is much more stringent on the uh, higher risk products than the lower risk products. So you have the regulatory component that, that, that makes it uh, more difficult. The other point I make is for our manufacturers, they often locate in different geographical regions, not just to, to export back to the United States, but to supply that geographical region. And China's one. Some of our manufacturers locate in China to supply the China market. And to give you a, a kind of an overview of that, our trade um, and medical devices is roughly balanced with the world. We export about $55, $60 billion a year, or we import about $55, $60 billion a year. That's a good, nice, balanced trade relationship. Similarly with China, we export about $6 billion, we import about $6 billion. It's a good, balanced trade relationship. So um, moving has a cost in terms of trade. It has a cost in terms of we're locating for the regional market. Um, and it has a cost in terms of just the physical um, uh, movement and the regulatory component. So uh, I, I agree with uh, what Alexander indicated, that if you provide us positive incentives, for some products, we might come back. But in other products, we're producing for regional market. And the incentive to bring back all the products to the United States just, just isn't there. We, we, we are a global business and we need to operate globally. Okay, so we are one minute away from closing. So um, I think I might just, uh, I guess, wrap up with a final thought of my own so that we can, we can everyone can get to the next panel on time, um, which is, I guess, really that goes back to an earlier point that Monica was making about, um, you know, thinking about what other countries are doing. For me, the big, um, you know, the, the biggest, uh, sadness of this crisis is that it, 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 you know, there was there was almost this hypocrisy, right? Rich countries have been telling the world, you need to open up your markets, um, you need to to 
you know, integrate into these global supply chains. And then when crisis hit, they said, oh, no, but we're going to keep everything. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, the, the precedent that was set there, um, I think it's going to be very difficult to restore that trust. And, you know, in future, when the US government is telling other governments, no, thou shalt open, you know, engage in an open and, and, you know, freer trade, um, those governments are going to say, well, well um, it's not what you did. Um, and, and those kinds of discussions are all going to become much more difficult. And for some products, that'll be fine. For the products that do require these big economies of scale, um, that's that's worrying. And, and ultimately, one fears that consumers are going to bear the costs. Um, thank you, everyone, for what has been a really interesting and enlightening discussion. Thank you for talking to each other. Doesn't always happen. I'm very, very grateful. Um, sometimes everyone just kind of, you know, freezes up in fear. Um, yeah, so um, I, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. I think now we're on to a working lunch. Um, so goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, Thanks, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You.